uh, our, our basic aim is to try and get one of the main ones, anyway, is to try to get the Climate Act, you know, you know repealed. Um, for that, we need MPs to be here, and that's the bill. That, that's really the purpose in coming here. And I'm not sure that we have any here. I think probably not. But um, that is the aim. Um, in, in the meantime, um, we have several speakers. First one is Matt Sinclair. You may well have heard. Uh, you may well have heard of. He has written a book called "Let, Let Them Eat Carbon." And um, I think Matt, if we could just carry on. Okay. So what I wanted to talk about today is why is the climate change act climate foolish? So we'll come back to the title today. What is it that makes that act uh, foolish? What is it that makes that act ineffective? What is it that makes the other things that politicians have do are, are doing about climate change uh, foolish? I don't think it's anything to do with the science. I think that uh, there will be debates among scientists about the science of climate change, and in uh, at some point, we may know uh, with definitively which side is right, we may not. Uh, and at that point, some of those scientists may be left looking climate foolish. They, uh, however, if a politician is asked to go, that if it's told that there is a threat of climate change, the people they go and insult are the very respectable voices uh, who are lined up saying that this is an issue. So they go and talk to them and they say, well, we have a problem. So politicians may be proved wrong in that judgment. They may be proved they have the wrong experts. It may be proved that those experts were foolish. But that isn't going to be the source by which politicians are exposed, any politicians are exposed to have been, have, have been a climate fool. So it doesn't say climate foolish. The ground on which they can properly be identified as foolish is the cost of these policies and their failure to achieve the desired objective. So, firstly on the cost, and the way I often like to start explaining how these, are, these policies are unavoidably expensive, is to go back to uh, what a French economist said in the 19th century, uh, Emile Levasseur. He's writing about uh, the impact of steam power. He says that steam engines in France, the energy they produce, and the horsepower that that's generated is equivalent to two and a half slaves for every Frenchman. It was two and a half mechanical and working on their love. Now, I've tried to update those numbers for today on a similar basis, and I think that the number in Britain working 24-7, 365, every day of the year, every minute, is 97 for every man, woman, and child. Now, that is, the, that is what... And the price they're paid, they, they are paid, isn't that they need to be fed from the same agricultural land, land as us. They're paid with fossil fuels. And if we make their services more expensive, if we pay them a lot more, or if we give up on some of their services altogether, then that is going to materially affect our standard of living. And it's that impact on living standards which, if it is done to, if it isn't offering proper value, if politicians have accepted a little our living standards because they've rationed fossil fuels, because that climate change acts the critical element of what it does, it limits the amount that can be emitted, it therefore rations fossil fuel energy. If it turns out that will have a very severe effect on living standards, while not delivering much results, then that will mean that those politicians have been climate foolish by voting through this act. The act deserves climate fools to be organised around it. The, well, the next speaker is Tim Foster. He's a uh, trained scientist. He's been a vicar and uh, an author and someone that is an indefatigable uh, in, uh, defender of our position. So perhaps we'd like to speak. Okay. Yeah. Um, very quickly, if you like, the long view of climate tells us that this isn't really an issue here. Uh, climate always changes, it's varying at all times, um, and so on. So, going on this system, there are a number of graphs of this kind, I happen to choose this one um, by Charles Archibald, which by proxy measurements shows that temperature and carbon dioxide do not directly relate over the long term at all. Uh, carbon dioxide levels are also extremely low. Now, extremely low. 0 
0.4% is tiny, we all know that. It has not been as low as this for 300 billion years, and even I wasn't born then. Okay, temperatures in the last 6 million years have generally been progressing downwards. Of course, temperatures fluctuate, ice ages, etc., etc., bouncing up and down. But basically, the overall trend is that the planet is slightly cooling um, overall. Then in the last 20,000 years, since the end of the last big ice age, <coughs> we have a shoot-up in temperatures, a shoot-up in sea levels, because the ice melted and so on. Um, and temperatures in the past eight or 9,000 years have been, on the whole, warmer than they are today. I always like to point out that the little bit that everybody gets terribly excited about, I've lost my thing that we hear at the moment, where's it got to? Um, anyway, pretty clear, right at the end, present global warming is a blip in terms of what's been going on in the past. Why there is an issue about it, um, I have to say, is bizarre, except for all the reasons we know. As we know, the last um, thousand years, there is the delusion, the hockey stick, which um, has been suitably debunked, suggesting the temperatures were steadily going down and then shot up, uh, Michael Mann and all that. Um, actually, this was done, I think, by uh, Hubert Lamb at the uh, University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit some years ago, suggesting that we have a middle and medieval warm period, a little ice age, and we're just slowly drifting out of that little ice age. Thankfully, um, it's a little pleasant, uh, whatever. This is the last uh, 120, 130 years, various graphs of this kind. The latest, latest from BEST doesn't tell us anything we didn't know before. Um, best temperatures are simply all the others are subsets of it. It's just rehashing old data, which is as unreliable or as reliable as you choose to make it, and it doesn't make uh, any difference. What well, Berkeley, um, Berkeley um, Earth, what's it, Earth S, Earth something temperatures, kind of couple what the S stands for. Okay, if you look at the same change over the last uh, 120 years, um, in regard to daily temperature fluctuations, which is always a useful thing to do, which can fluctuate by 40 degrees in some parts of the world in 24 hours, um, that is what the line looks like. You can hardly see a change. Now, I know it's not its apples and um, pears here, but what I'm getting at is a change of half to one degree centigrade in 120 years really is nothing to get upset about. <coughs> Um, because it's tiny compared to what happens daily. If the temperature were one degree warmer tomorrow than it is today, what major decisions would you make in your life about what you would do? Now, it's of no consequence that there is a change, an overall supposed change, if it means anything, of one degree. Okay, we know also, um, this is connected with BEST in a way, but we know that they were actually pulling out uh, temperature stations which they didn't want to use, in order, in a sense, suggested that temperatures drifted upwards. Um, that may or may not be a fair comparison. The number of uh, stations that were cut compared to the rise of temperature, well, it's a question anyway as to what any of those so-called global temperatures actually mean. Okay, what they really rely on are their computer models, complicated supposedly, uh, but in fact, computer models are not reliable things. They are flat Earth models. They are disks, that's how they have to do it. They can't, as far as I understand it, you cannot work out um, a viscous flow on a sphere. It's almost impossible to model it, it's just too complicated. But they use a flat disk as a basis, disk world, if you like, um, what's his name, uh, his books. Terry Pratchett is the guy I'm after here. Um, but basically they are flat earth disks, and I always savour this fact because people like my, myself are referred to as flat earthers because we don't have to accept the pseudoscience uh, that they produce, if you'll forgive my over-the-top things here. Okay, that's what their models predict, this warm spot in the troposphere, supposedly getting warmer uh, from the equator outwards, that's what the computer model based on the CO2 concepts produce. Reality is completely and utterly different. And if you want a proof, uh, if you like, or a disproof of a theory, a hypothesis said it would do this. When you measured it, it did that. Answer, there's something wrong with the hypothesis if it can't actually produce reality. Both of those were in the IPCC reports. I'm not inventing this. Uh, the, the picture that supposedly supported the CO2 
was in the front, chapter 1. This was tucked away in chapter 5, which people probably never got around to reading. Um, show you what actually was going on. Okay, well, I was like saying, well, worry? Well, frankly, uh, the most likely real climate shock humanity will receive in the next thousand years, maybe, uh, is a new big ice age. That's the kind that puts a mile of ice over Britain and is going to make wind turbines look pretty silly uh, as they try to struggle to survive that. Okay, reveal the climate act. I'm moving hastily on here into the politics, uh, as it were. Chris Hume has been referred to. Um, a few days ago, I thought they got his medication right because he was beginning to support shale gas. And I thought, gosh, they've actually got his medication right. But clearly yesterday or the day before, he stopped taking his medication and we're back where we were before with him uh, arguing, even with Osborne, who, uh, as Denning neatly put it, uh, wanted to Britain to commit suicide rather more slowly uh, than they were planning to do in the past uh, by slowing down the uh, effects of the climate act. Okay, why repeat it? Well, we know it's based on pseudoscience. Carbon dioxide is harmless to the climate. Carbon dioxide makes plants and therefore makes food. This planet is a remarkably competent piece of kit because as populations rise and more crops are needed and more energy is used, the wonderful thing is, as we burn the energy, it makes more food to feed the people. I call that pretty neat. I have to believe in God. But that's, you know, by the by, I have to think something's going on there, but that's a, a matter of not debate today. I have a slogan, and I'm sticking with it. Cutting carbon kills. Cutting carbon kills. If you cut carbon dioxide, you can't do it very easily, but if you try, less crops grow, people die who are on the borderline between life and death because of crop failure. CO2 makes crops grow. I don't know how you know. It needs to be stated again and again. CO2 is the good guy in, in the atmosphere. It is the life-giving gas. Without CO2, nothing can live. I sent round on my sort of email circuit a wonderful comment um, of a friend of a friend who was going to the Canadian High Commission to get his passport renewed and he walked back past the Department of Energy and Climate Change Grand Building. Outside it was a, a civil servant in shirt sleeves at about lunchtime smoking his um, lunchtime cigarette because you're not allowed to smoke inside. This person went up to him and said, uh, that's interesting, it can't be very good for, uh, for global warming, smoking your cigarette. And the guy said, you don't have to believe that tosh to work here. <laughs> As we've already said, as Matt has explained, the whole concept of the Climate Change Act is driving many more people into fuel poverty. Now these are my figures based on the fact that I reckon energy prices are rising at 20% a year. That's what's happened this year. Basically they've gone up by 20% gas and electricity are shooting up. But if that goes on year by year, for the next 10 years, prices will have risen by 400%. In 2020, DEC informed me in one of their splendid letters, the price rise per annum is likely to be 1% in 2020. What happened before that, they were totally and utterly reluctant to say. So on the basis of that, I think people might be a little relieved that by 2020, if their bills have gone up 400%, that it's only going to rise by another 1% or 2% that year. Phew. Um, but of course, we know why this is happening, because of the crazy policies um, we have. The whole business of feed-in tariffs, uh, renewables obligation certificates, and so on, is an open invitation to criminals and crooks um, most of the wind farms in Italy and Spain are run indirectly by the Mafia because it's a wonderful money laundering exercise. Lord Oxborough, who has his manufacturing of wind turbines in Italy, his companies, you may not personally be aware of it, are involved with Mafia activity because that's the only way you get these things built. We're dealing with crooks on a massive scale. Um, and, as somebody once put it, it's the quickest and best way to take money from the poor and to give it to the rich. Instance are the beloved Prime Minister's father-in-law who makes £350,000 a year just by having wind turbines on his land and doing absolutely nothing. Isn't that nice? £350,000, that's even more than his son-in-law earns. Um, even with expenses, as far as I can work out. I find that absolutely shocking. Here's a little analogy for you.
for you. Using wind turbines and solar panels to run a country's electricity supply is like collecting dew to provide a city's water supply. That's about sums it up. Wind turbines cannot begin to produce the energy needed. You can research yourself till you're blue in the face and there isn't a hope. The energy in the wind and in solar is far too thinly spread to be of any use to human beings. Uh, as things stand. We need lots of energy and we need it cheap. The Greens do not want us to have energy cheap. The famous comment of Ehrlich was, um, to give cheap energy to humankind is like giving a loaded revolver to a child. That's their view. They want it expensive and they seem to want, therefore, people to die as a consequence. As we've already said, these high prices in electricity, which the Climate Act has generated, is destroying what little industry we have left. Remember, the Red Car Steel Park, which is closed down and been bought up by um, what's his name in India, uh, sorry, created it, got himself all the carbon credits, and then closed it down in order to get more carbon credits. Um, in one sense, you can't blame these guys. Um, there's a money opportunity you make it. You don't worry about the ethics of it. Um, then the issue of peak oil anyway, no such thing, um, never has been, it's always been 40 years ahead, but of course oil companies find this convenient because by having a rare commodity as they see it, they can raise the prices, that's fair enough, they're in business, if people are stupid enough to believe them. Shale gas, uh, unlimited supplies, uh, I would say for the next 100 years, because we've only just started to find the stuff, and what they found under Lancashire and out of Morgan Bay will last us 60 years totally and utterly on our, without any imports. And now they're talking about building more oil import terminals. Why waste the money? The stuff is in the ground to get out right now. As I said, I thought Hume had got his medication right and seems to be getting along with this now. Um, but uh, sadly, hasn't. Um, things are going back again. So I just really want to come back around to uh, Green Isn't Working, um, which is a, a nice slogan. Um, and uh, to say, if you haven't signed up to the e-petition, we all know what happens to e-petitions, of course. There was one on Monday, which got debated in Parliament, but it did at least cause a stir. Um, and I love the idea that MPs can say, so well, it was a backbencher's idea. It wasn't, it was the people's idea, but they never mind that. Um, but if you will sign up to the e-petition, um, it's on the literature, it's on your flyers, um, please do. What Matt said about the difficulty of mixing up the science and the politics is, is a fair point. And the worst thing is politicians who know nothing talking about science. Um, but the reason why we have to sort of mix them sometimes is because climate science is the religion, in fact, to justify the politics of um, exploitation uh, behind the uh, Climate Change Act. Right. Now, at the Congress of Brilliant Minds, uh, I was put in a debate with uh, Morio Molina, Nobel Prize winner, um, for work on ozone, who's the chief ideologue of the ICPCC, and Jeremy Rifkin. So it was two against one. Uh, we insisted on those grounds I go lost. Okay. Um, but I was completely astounded by the absolute zero, zero, I say zero content of what these gentlemen said. Uh, the actual words of uh, um, uh, Marino was that the, the, uh, the evidence for climate change, meaning the CO2 climate change, is the consensus. Sorry, I looked at him. That's all he said. Now, in the debate, I had to remind him what the official version is of his ideologues in the University of East Anglia. Uh, and he didn't have answers to those either. But what I told him what those were, namely, when we asked at the Royal Society, 200 people there, he said, please give us what you regard, you regard as the reasons for man-made climate change. They said, one, it, plants don't do as much cooling as you said. Okay, well, who knows, but what did we say exactly anyway, except they did some cooling. Two, Venus. Is this on Earth? No, okay. Three,
free, it couldn't be anything else. What? <laughs> we know. We, we can predict things. We see them on the sun, they have them on Earth. So it couldn't be something else. Now, I put that to him and said, that's the answers. Have you got answers? No. He had no answers. All he said was, uh, you are not, not uh, with the consensus, therefore you are against uh, normal science and quantum mechanics and all that. When I first started bringing physics from Imperial College, I taught quantum mechanics, I taught electromagnetism, I said exams in these things, and you say, I'm not a scientist, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually beggared the loop, and afterwards people said to me, look, they were pathetic. I introduced myself and I refused to apologise for not speaking Italian, uh, Italian sorry, um, because I said, but for the storm which drove away the Armada, it may be that I would have been speaking <laughs> <laughs> Just to remind you what it's about, it's the economy and energy prices. That's why it's important. Uh, Alright, next one. There you are, this will do. Um, what we say is that the CO2 theory of climate change has failed and must be rejected, and the rest of our world has failed. And now we say, although this isn't the reason for rejecting a failed theory, this is something else, but it's more exciting, we now have a new paradigm, a solar magnetic lunar effects uh, paradigm called the solar lunar action technique, which reliably predicts extreme events and climate change. I have to admit, we haven't got as far as the climate change because we've taken some years to do that. But we can explain climate change to have that. Um, and this is a game changer, and what we say is, in summary, the world will continue to call until 2035, and we'll have a little ice age then, where the world temperature will be one or two degrees below currently. Um, and uh, there will be more extreme events in the next two years or so, and then there will be a decline in extreme events. Um, and we need to have a policy change to bring the world back to reality. Okay, now later I'm going to give six forecasts of extreme events around the world which are going to happen in the next uh, 18 months. Forecasts. For the period from the 27th of November to 28th of December, we're about, I suppose, 80% sure of this, rather than 5%, but we will check. The UK, well, maybe not the UK, Britain, West Europe, and probably including Spain, will be exceptionally cold for that long period. There will be fluctuations within it exceptionally cold. Now, cold or less cold than last year, not sure. We're working there. There will be huge snowfalls at times, especially around December the 2nd, and or probably 1st, 2nd, and 14th, 15th. Around then, it will take a day or so. Um, and this <coughs> will basically be driven by Arctic or northeasterly from. Um, okay, USA for the 15th to 17th of December, where we're about 75% sure of this one, very interesting. Probably going to be an exceptionally mild lot um, in the north central parts of the USA, like Chicago. Exceptionally <coughs> mild. There's going to be big changes in America. Then, Later, in Canada and North USA, around the 31st of December, going into January, exceptional cold. So, end December, moving into January, exceptional cold appearance. I mean, exceptional compared with the North. Then, the Northeast USA, 11th to 14th of January, massive snowfalls. You know, feet, sort of stuff. Well, or whatever. I suppose feet is even normal for some of them, so more things are feet. More, a lot more than normal. Um, then we have a very interesting thing, 17th to 19th of January, 
some extreme windstorms hitting the northwest of the USA and the south part of Canada there. Extremely windy and storm damaging winds. So it's quite interesting stuff we've got there. Um, right, and then the last thing, if you're going to get bored of that and want to go to the southern hemisphere, we think from the 18th of January for about two weeks, um, and we are 75% sure of this, will be very extreme heat in parts of Australia, such as Adelaide. Um, but we need to broaden that back because that's just now in the moment. We are, what, nearly four years uh, beyond the climate change act which went through this place with very or little, little or no thought uh, and I do uh, and indeed many people I think took the kind of attitude that Boris Johnson has taken you know where uh, he doesn't believe any of what he's too scared to say otherwise and he's, if you get somebody yeah, yeah. like Boris Johnson saying that someone who's prepared to stick his neck out on a lot of issues I think you can see the kind of um, pressures that there were on members of Parliament here uh, when it came to the Climate Change Act. And of course, we're all living with the consequences of that time. One of the most costly pieces of legislation which has ever gone through the House of Commons. And indeed, uh, you know, last week we had a debate, uh, an opposition day debate, on fuel poverty and the impact of fuel prices on households across the United Kingdom. I, I, I was very pleased at being able to get speaking in the debate and make the point that the very people who were complaining about the impact of uh, energy price increases on their constituents were the people who had voted through. <laughs> 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 um, and surprisingly, uh, because you know, even the Department of energy and climate change itself has accepted that as a result of the policies which have to be used to get the carbon reduction targets met, uh, that domestic energy prices will go up by 33% and business, uh, uh, commercial energy prices will go up by 46%. That's the department themselves who are, uh, uh, who are, are saying that. And um, you know, there seems to be this disconnect between, on one hand, complaining about the consequences of uh, what's uh, been chosen and the, the, the choices that were, were made at that particular time. I actually think that we're winning the debate on this. I mean, first of all, the public are much more sceptical than what they were. And you know, whether that's because the, the, the Met predict that we're going to have the warmest winter ever and get it wrong not once but twice and uh, we're going to have the hottest summers and they don't turn out that way um, or whether it's because we get uh, the University of East Anglia exposed for fiddling the figures and that in, in, in turn uh, reduces uh, people's confidence in all of the science or whether or not people just see the vast consequences that the, uh, the whole climate change lobby and the policies of the climate change lobby are having on their own individual lives in terms of what happens to the prices they pay for things, the freedoms that they have, the way in which their lives are continually interfered with um, as a result of these policies. I think that the general public are now getting that message through. Surprisingly, in the debate last week, when I spoke, there were a number of people, I've got to say, mostly from the Conservative uh, benches, who actually rose. They might not have been quite as strident in how they expressed themselves on the issue, but nevertheless, they were beginning to raise issues about are we really disadvantaging our economy? You know, we produce, what, 1.7% of CO2 emissions in the world and yet we're strangling our economy, distorting our economy to try and reduce those emissions um, when the rest of the world doesn't seem to be to have any concerns about it. And you know, as, I, as I pointed out, uh, on, on one hand, and the minister, um, uh, Chris Hume, 
that you know, talked about. Even if we use gas, we have to have carbon capture storage for using gas um, and everything else. I point out to you, know, here's Germany planning 20 coal-fired power stations, not to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're, they're not going to strangle their economy as a result. It is encouraging, of course, to see there's not just backbenchers who are now asking for some re-election, uh, realism to be um, considered here. We now actually have George Osborne who is saying that you know if the targets which we are setting are going to disadvantage our economy, then perhaps we have to look at them. We should not be moving faster than other countries are prepared to move. And many other companies are beginning to realise um, by peers and um, Reverend Foster and, and all of the rest on the science and, and refuting the science. What really will resound with people, I think, uh, who perhaps don't delve into all of the science here is what impact does this have on my job? What impact does this have on my standard of living? What impact does this have on the things which I am free to do as a citizen? And, um, uh, Nigel Lawson uh, came along to the meeting. We had a very, very good discussion, and um, we're going to get some work done on briefing MPs as to the consequences of these policies, and hopefully that, that briefing material will then, uh, because I think that there probably are a lot of sympathetic ears now in the House of Commons, um, uh, uh, hopefully those kind of briefings will start filtering through the contributions that people make in debates. So, you know, I think that there, there is an important job to be done in continuing to attack the, the dodgy science which is attached to this. Equally, there's an, uh, since there now appears to be a much more ready market for the arguments as to the consequences of all of this, then we've got to capitalise on that. And, you know, even on the labour benches, uh, um, there, there's, a, there's now an all-party uh, group uh, uh, set up on it. it's um, mostly Labour MPs who represent constituencies where there's still a coal mining interest and they're now arguing why are we killing off an industry? We will talk about fuel security and energy security. Why are we killing off uh, an industry which actually has huge amounts of resources which could provide energy for the United Kingdom over the next hundreds of years. And yet, because of policies, we're disadvantaging um, areas of, of Britain where employ there could be employment and extracting those resources, then using those resources to provide secure energy. And we're not dependent then upon some of these states where they will use energy supplies as a political weapon against us. And I think there is a very, very compelling um, argument there. And of course, there's now, and so this is probably perhaps uh, more amongst many of the Conservative members, there's a realisation that the cost of um, these unrealistic renewable targets is not just a cost in terms of uh, providing electricity, which is three and a half times more expensive than what can be provided by gas, but also there's the consequences in the constituencies where people are increasingly concerned about the number of wind farms, the environmental impact of those wind farms, the visual impact of those wind farms. So there's, there, even for those people who are not convinced that we are right on the science, there are many who don't like the practical consequences. And I think that's the market that we as MPs um, have to tap into. And, I mean, we're a very small minority at the moment who are actually prepared to challenge the current thinking on but you know, I think that increasingly as science have to, scientists have to explain that changes in the sun's activity are affecting climate. How do you explain the very cool spells we've had over the last while? Well, actually, there are, and there are more scientists prepared to say, well, is the sun stupid? You know, uh, you can catch yourself <laughs> wrong. Um, but, but as, as people uh, begin to question, uh, of some of the science, uh, but then you know, even if, they, if, they're, if they're not totally convinced that our argument is right, let's find the grounds on which we do have some common um, approaches we can be 
income from and let's exploit that. So I think that the, 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 the sterling work which has been done in challenging some of the, 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 the madness which has developed around this uh, has, has now bearing fruit in um, the, 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 the political sphere here in Westminster. A long way to go. I understand that. And you know, even when I was uh, speaking last week, I mean, as soon as I introduced the whole idea, well, you know, because the, 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 the Labour motion actually complained about energy prices and then said, and in order to meet with our obligations, <laughs> oh, and so I, I started pointing out the kind of contradiction. On well, one hand, you're complaining about energy prices, on the other hand, you're saying, but, but let's keep on with the policies which give us dear energy in order to save the world, you know, and you know, uh, you always have to be fun with that.